Hey, we haven't talked about psychedelics yet. Yes. I would love to take a bit of a dive into, let's start with psilocybin, the active compound mm -hmm. in magic mushrooms, more commonly known. You've been doing work in veterans affairs, samples, and people with mood disorders. Does that include people with bipolar disorder or more kind of major depression? So the thing we did in Palo Alto is with folks with very severe treatment-resistant depression. Most of them were co-occurring with PTSD, which is not surprising in a military sample. The PTSD did not impact whether they responded to the psilocybin. But I also have a close collaborator, Scott Aronson, and he did a bipolar 2 study, of which I think I'm a co-author on his paper. It's the first published bipolar 2 study. Now, Josh Woolley at UC San Francisco is doing another bipolar study. I think you're yeah. a consultant on that. Right. And I believe you told me Lakshmi Yatham in Vancouver just got a grant to do more on bipolar 2, so... Great. So in Scott's study, it was a one-time dosing. It was not treatment-resistant depression like what we did in the vets and he did in the civilian. It was depression, but an episode of some duration. And they dosed about 15 people. And I thought the results were very surprising. It was a, a very unusual rate of remission and response. You know, again, I think the bipolar brain, I wasn't surprised in the sense I think the bipolar brain can shift a little bit more if you give it a chance, right? You have to find the right, I always think of it as like you're cracking the diamond on the head to find the right combination or what are the right approaches to help somebody really stabilize. So I think it's going to require some long, longer term follow up. I also know some of the other studies may not be finding quite the same rate of remission and response. Now, having said that, I do think it's important to realize that we're, we're always focused on response and remission, but how about the people who don't respond? Mm -hmm. And there's always at least about 30%, if not more, once you're out to 12 weeks and longer. And many of these people go into studies with psilocybin expecting a miracle. And what if you're one of the 30, 40, 50% who don't respond? That can be uh, really devastating. And I feel, unfortunately, the media is still doing somewhat of a disservice. Now, I think embedded in your question was about the use for psilocybin. So I think I am very excited by the bipolar 2 studies because I think in bipolar 2, you know, you, if you're discontinuing drugs that could have interaction with the psilocybin, like some antidepressants, you know, of course, you have to be very careful. We had to discontinue drugs in our study, about half the people. You have to really, you know, be in good touch with them, be sure they're doing okay, because even when they aren't working, they can still have an effect. And we have to think about the effects on sleep in particular and bipolar disorder of these types yeah. of interventions. What about microdosing? Have you got thoughts on microdosing? That's another question we get a lot. Yeah. Through. No, I think microdosing, the studies I've seen, and there have been some nice ones. Harriet DeWitt has done some good studies in Chicago, and also Robin Curtin Harris. There hasn't been separation from placebo and the microdosing. And what so, kind of samples were those studies? LSD, and they were uh, up to 100 people. They weren't small. Some of them were good placebo crossover studies, I thought, where the patient was masked. They just really didn't know what they were getting. And in those studies, there wasn't a difference. Everybody reported some benefit, but there actually wasn't a lot of, there wasn't difference between placebo and microdosing. So one of the things I feel that we're learning from so really psychedelics that we haven't yet started working on is the power of the mind. So if microdosing is as effective as a placebo, that's interesting. And if we're getting surprising results with psilocybin, if somebody stays well for 9, 10, 12 months who've been ill continuously for 10 years, I think that we need to sit up and think about what that's telling us. It isn't always the drug. It might also be something going on remodeling in the brain. There's more to come. I think people are not done looking at microdosing. And LSD in particular is easier to microdose because it's such small quantities and it's synthetic. Now, you, we didn't talk about MDMA, which the chemical name, somebody told me I should be sure to always be able to say this. It's 3,4-methylene-dioxymethamphetamine. Well done. That's MDMA. <laughs> and MDMA is probably going to be approved, barring unexpected hitches by the FDA. It'll be rescheduled, if, assuming there aren't big hitches. 
They've had two successful phase three studies, which is the requirement to petition the FDA for approval. And if it's approved, it would be for PTSD. Mm -hmm. So the fact it is an amphetamine, again, would suggest that in bipolar disorder, it should be used with caution. Mm -hmm. But watch this space. Yeah, I think think there's a lot more to unfold with MDMA. Again, you're decreasing meds that could interact. Right. So, but I, I think the space is not done. I mean, we're at the, hopefully the front edge of about 20 years of research. And I think there's just a lot more to learn. I just think it's important to remember, not everyone's going to respond. Some people will respond. And we're just still learning about who responds and why do they respond. We don't know yet. So it's an interesting set of studies for sure. So would that be something that we'd call kind of personalized medicine approaches, thinking about, yeah? Yeah, I think that would fall under personalized medicine because if we can predict who will respond better than someone else, I think that can be a big step forward. 